Hello, everyone. It's Lionel Sandner from Pembroke Publishers, and thanks for joining us today for our webinar. Uh, it's really nice to have you here. If you're uh, first time this is one of your webinars with us, welcome. It's uh, it's really nice that you've taken some time on what I suspect is a busy day to uh, to sit down and spend a little bit of time with our uh, with our author today. If you've been to our sessions before, it's really nice to have you back as well. So thank you. Uh, just before we get started, I would like you to know that Pembroke Publishers' head office is situated upon traditional territories of the Wendat, the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of Scugog, Hiawatha First Nation, Alderville First Nation, and the Métis Nation. The treaty covering this area of land in Toronto, Ontario, was collectively known as the Williams Treaties of 1923. I would also like to acknowledge and thank the Wasanic people on whose traditional traditional territory I live, work, and learn. The Wasanic people have lived and worked on this land since time immemorial. And I wish to recognize the significant contributions of Indigenous peoples across this land. We seek a new relationship with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, one based in honour and deep respect. And just before I introduce our presenter for today, uh, if you do have any technical problems during the session, please just uh, drop a note in the chat. Uh, you just put an at Lionel before that, and then I'll be able to deal with you and get you uh, get you straightened away and figured out as fast as possible. Uh, also, the, the way to, uh, to participate today is sort of two ways. You'll notice your cameras and microphones are off. So in the chat, I will monitor the chat and we'll leave enough time at the end uh, of the presentation just to have a conversation with, with Lori, our presenter. And, uh, and I'll bring any of your questions or as many questions I can in the time that we have forward to her and just make sure that we can, uh, we can share the thoughts from the group. We also have a Twitter stream, so if you are a Twitter fan, please feel free to tweet out with the hashtag Pembroke uh, webinars, and that will be captured uh, within the stream and will show up in the chat as well under the Twitter tab. You'll also notice Lori will be doing a poll uh, fairly early uh, at the top of your your chat bar, or the chat column. There is a uh, a poll tab. If you click on that, you'll be able to answer the poll when it's released in a couple of minutes. So with that, uh, all the sort of the technical uh, little pieces done, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, she's known to friends and colleagues as Laurie Jameson. Uh, if you are familiar with any of her writing, of which is fairly extensive, you'll know her as Laurie Jameson Rock. Uh, Laurie is an educator, an author, and a consultant. Uh, she's had a career as a classroom teacher as K-12 language arts consultant for the Regina Public Schools and a reading assessment specialist for the Saskatchewan Department of Education. She also has a, another rather unique uh, uh, part of her resume and, and I, I, I don't often uh, meet folks that are elected to uh, represent Canada at uh, in any kind of uh, international association. I had a similar experience with the National Science Teachers Association. So uh, so it's nice to meet a, a someone else who put their name forward. And uh, Lori was on the board of directors of the IRA or the International Reading Association. So I suspect that those experiences along with the classroom experiences inform not only today, but all her writing as well. Uh, Lori has written seven books for Pembroke. So uh, anyone that's done any work in the writing world knows that Lori is a uh, focused and uh, able to, when the weather is really nice, close all the doors and uh, and write to meet the deadlines that are required. So, you know, we thank you for all the probably nice days you gave up uh, to, uh, to to write the, the, the seven books that you did. Uh, she's also the education director for High Interest Publishing, which publishes novels for struggling readers. Uh, Lori's currently an independent consultant based in uh, beautiful Vancouver and, and before COVID, she traveled across North America consulting with schools and speaking to teachers about best practices in, lit in literacy instruction. And I do know from uh, our, our conversations, she's continuing doing that virtually. And so we are very fortunate today that she's taking the time to, uh, to sit down and, uh, and virtually share some thoughts around Let's Get Writing. So Laurie, it's great to have you here. I'll pass the virtual mic over to you and we'll get started. 
Thanks, Lionel. And thank you all for joining us this uh, afternoon slash evening. I know folks out here on, on what my grandson calls the edge of Canada um, are just finished their school day. You've all put in a full day and you've got another day to get ready for tomorrow. So I, I do appreciate that. I'm sure my, my BC friends are you know, just dragging themselves out of the classroom at this point. And our, my prairie friends, you guys must be getting ready for dinner. And oh, for, for my fo folks from Ontario, Quebec, and the Atlantic provinces, now we're infringing on Netflix territory. So I better make sure that, that we make this worthwhile, because no doubt you would rather be binging on Bridgerton. But I commend your dedication to writing and to children and to literacy that you would give up this time uh, today. And we'll do our best to share some practical ideas and solutions with you. Um, You've heard a lot about me. Curious to know what is your current teaching situation? I'm going to ask Lionel to put up a poll. And I'd like to just indicate, are you in the classroom full time? Are you teaching full time online? Are you doing a hybrid of both? And I guess for you folks in Toronto and Peel, who knows what you'll be doing tomorrow? <laughs> I know you got like, what, a, a few hours notice when uh, you weren't going back to school. So I should have added another another criterion, who knows? But I'll give you a minute uh, to uh, for Lionel to put up the poll. It should be there, Laurie. If you click on the open tab, you can see the numbers coming in. Okay. And you've almost got everybody there. I do. And ha can they all see it, Lionel, or just yep. me? Yep. Okay. Yep. You can all see that the majority, the, a slight majority, are doing all in-person teaching. I know we in BC have been doing in-person teaching since June without stop. Um, some of you are doing a little of both and a few of you aren't in the classroom at this time. I have to say, for those of you doing online teaching, I found this on a teacher's website and I just think it's so hilarious. I mean, we're standing on our heads to get kids to take, keep kids' attention when, <laughs> when they're in front of us. But boy, online, here's the teacher and here's her husband who's an office worker and his, you know, entire meeting consists of, mm -hmm, yep, yep, let's do it. So, uh, I see that that almost half of you are teaching in person, about a quarter online, uh, about a quarter doing a little bit of both. And uh, I thank you for that work you do. The only way that we have been able to open up everything else is because you are doing your jobs and and the, the, the trials and tribulations we've been through over the last year and you have just um, jumped to the challenge and, and we are all so appreciative of it. Lionel mentioned I have written several books for Pembroke. Um, the uh, when in talking with Mary Machusi about what to focus on for this session, we decided to look at writing because um, writing lends itself so much better to teaching online. Reading is hard to teach online because a you need you know you need material to read, so we have to give the kids special resources, and b it's an in the head thing, so we don't always know what they're doing. Whereas in writing, we've got a product to look at. We can do a lesson. They can work independently and we can touch base with them. The other thing, of course, I love about writing instruction is it, it, it meets every student where he or she he is. And to me, that is the most powerful thing. And I find my struggling students, I've been working most recently with struggling readers, and they respond the best to writing workshop because for some of them, this is the only time in their day when the work isn't too hard. It meets them where they are. Not only that, of course, we don't need a whole lot of special materials. You need something to write with and something to write on. Boy, I sounded Saskatchewan there, didn't I? Something to write with and something to write on. <laughs> um, the um, it, in the classroom, most I'm finding most of our primary and elementary students are using pen and paper for writing. But now, if they're online, you know, hopefully they have access to word processing. And we know from research that kids write more, and they're more willing to revise when they can do their writing online. So another advantage of using writing for online learning. For many of our students, writing is their entry point into literacy. For many of our children, um, learn to write before they learn to read. This is my grandson was who 
was in kindergarten, was more excited about St. Patrick's Day this year than I think he was about Christmas, to be honest. And this is his first independent writing. And I said to him, Jake, do you want to read this book with me? And he says, I don't know how to read, but I know how to write. And that was Donald Gray's experience, too. Our our youngest uh, students are often write before they read. And our English language learners, writing is the entry point into literacy, English literacy for them. But, and I'll just share two quick pieces of research before we get into some more practical applications. Um, Steve Brayman and uh, Michael Hebert did a meta-analysis of the research on the reading-writing connection and found that writing was the single best way to support comprehension and retention of information. Even They even include writing answers to comprehension questions uh, as powerful ways to develop, uh, develop reading comprehension. If you've ever heard of the 90-90-90 schools, um, you'll know that writing was a big focus for them. This was a study in the U.S. that that's, uh, came from Harvard University, Doug Reeves. They looked at schools where 90% of the students were high poverty, 90% were minorities, and 90% were scoring at or above state standards. And they looked at these schools that were really beating the odds. You know, we've, we've often heard our, our evaluation, our assessment guru, Doug Wilms, I've heard him say um, in Canada that a child's test scores are often a better indicator of their postal code than anything else. But so what they looked at was these children in schools that beat the odds, kindergarten to college, and looked for what did they have in common? One of the main things was writing in every subject. So the science teacher had to become a teacher of writing. The gym teacher had to become a teacher of writing. And what they found was that when students did writing in every class, their scores in their um, evaluation in every subject improved. So I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but I, I just wanted to give you a little background on why it is so critical that we make sure kids are writing all day long. Now, they can't write to learn effectively if we don't teach them to learn, if they don't have opportunities to learn to write. And that's why I think we need a dedicated time uh, regular time every day, ideally, if, if not certainly on a regular basis, for teaching kids what writers do. And, and that is really so very critical, that teaching time. Most of us call that the writing workshop. And I know some people say, oh, writing workshop sounds like mountains of marking and classroom chaos. But, you know, everybody's writing workshop looks a little different. And it's basically just some teaching time, some writing time, some sharing time. Generally speaking, I find the teaching time, I will go 15 minutes max. In fact, I'll often set a timer for 10 minutes. And if I'm still teaching when the timer goes, I'll say, we'll finish this lesson tomorrow because we want to spend the time on writing. Now, if you look at the writing time, 20 minutes, I know some of your kindergarten teachers, 20 minutes is barely enough for kindergarten. Sure, it takes a little time to build the stamina, but for your kids, your grade sevens are going to, they take the first 10 minutes to find their pens. Uh, so we really need to give them sustained time. And although the research says, you know, ideally every single day, I would say I would prefer to have two days a week of 60 minutes of writing, uh, entire writing workshop time, than four days a week of 30 minutes or five days a week of 30 minutes, just because that sustained time and attention is so critical. And then at the end, we share, save 10 minutes for sharing. Pretty simple. What you do in the rest of in uh, the rest of the organizational structure is going to be unique to you and to your class. And it might look different this year than it looks uh, looked last year or looks next year. So looking at the uh, at that that time for dedicated writing instruction and my golden rule of writing is you are never done writing until writing time is done. That is, I never again, I never again want to hear, well, teacher, I'm done. What do I do now? Or have that trail of children following us around, you know, with their papers. So right from kindergarten, I try to establish a routine that you are responsible for your own time. 
you're never done writing until writing time is done. You can finish a piece you started another. If you finish what you're working on right now, you can finish a piece you started another day. You can go back into a piece that maybe you thought was done and make it better or start a new piece. The responsibility is yours. And maybe you added some other things like have a peer conference, talk to a partner. Um, but basically, this is the rule. Don't be coming to me saying, what do I do when I'm done? When you're done, you've just begun. In fact, even K-1s are not off the hook. I teach them you can add more details to your picture. You think you're done? Tell me, uh, what color is your dog? Oh, well, you can color it brown. Add more writing or start a new piece. Now, knowing, of course, that five-year-olds are often smarter than I am, I learned the hard way not to introduce start a new piece until we've established the routines of add more details to your picture and add more writing, or they'll just fill up a whole new book with, with scribbles. But it might take the entire month of September to get this routine in place, but it is so worth it to make the students accountable and independent for managing their own time. You know, we kind of we kind of make fun sometimes of the helicopter parents out there, but I think we're often helicopter teachers. We, you know, we say, when you're finished this, do this, and then do this, and then you can do that. And then, you know, uh, when are our students going to build that independence and self-regulation? Um, <clears throat> so this is the number one thing I start with in the fall, if I do nothing else, this, if I can get this routine in place, it will free me up to do the things I was trained to do that actually make kids better readers, writers, and thinkers. That's what I love. That's what I love about writing workshop is I think it is the time of day, the part of our classroom day when kids are the most, have the most independence. I've already talked about writing workshop. I have my kids, they, I don't assign topics, they choose their topics, they decide what they're going to publish. I, and if they're K-1, that's pretty much nothing. I don't have kids in K-1 publish writing. I don't see the point of it. And in grade two and beyond, I have them draft three, publish one. So out of every three pieces they write, they take one to publication. The flip side of that is for every piece they publish, they should have created three separate rough drafts. I've talked about time management and then talking to a partner. Most of us have need to socialize during writing. One of the little tips I've gotten from my friend Jennifer Jacobson, who's written a few books on writing, is she starts with the, the first 10 minutes she calls the quiet 10 and she plays soft music. And that means during the quiet 10, you don't get up and move around. You don't talk to anybody else. This is the time for those kids who need silence to get started. When the music stops, that's when you can get up and go to the editing table or chat with a partner about what you're going to write about next or have a peer conference. <clears throat> now, some, for some people, it's a little controversial to say the kids always choose their own topics. And partly because Number one, they think uh, we know it's a life skill to be able to write to a prompt. Most of us don't do any writing unless we're prompted. Write a report on a student, write a newsletter, uh, entry, uh, an entry for the school newsletter. But my kids are prompted all day long. They're prompted in science to write up the science experiment or to make a labeled diagram of the amaryllis plant. They're prompted in uh, in the gym to write the rules of a game or how to do a layup. They're prompted in reading to write a summary of a story. They are prompted all day long. This is the time when they have to choose their own topics. Now, the second problem, of course, is I can't think of anything to write about. Donald Graves, the father of the writing process, has said that if your students can't think of anything to write about, they aren't writing enough. The more you write, the easier it is to see the world as a writer. But that said, I'm not going to take any chances that a student will be sitting there for the entire writing time thinking of a topic. That's not acceptable either. Writing time is for writing. So I want to share a couple of things that I love to do. And this is the, the anchor of writing ideas anchor chart that I just keep somewhere hopefully visible in the classroom. And anything we've talked about in school can be a topic for writing. So 
And sometime of the day when we have a little time, we'll add a couple of things. Oh, we sang the song, our favorite things. We learned that in music. Why don't you write your own words to our favorite, my favorite things? Or, um, you know, we read about an earthquake. We planted bean seeds. You don't have to go to Disneyland to have something to write about. Then when the page fills up, I just cut it in strips, cut the, cut out the strips and put them in a big gift bag from my, those of you who know me, know my favorite teacher store is Dollarama, uh, a big gift bag. And we put, I put the, the idea strips and start a new piece of paper. So first of all, there's always a list of things that a reference point that kids can look at. But if they're really stuck for an idea, they can, they get to draw an idea out of the big ideas bag. The catch is, if you decide to take the plunge, you've got to write about it. No double dipping. You and I know that everything that's in that bag was something we that was up on a chart yesterday or the day before or the week before, that everything is a shared experience. And I really, I use this right through into middle school, this, these topics and, you know, draw a topic. So that is really a saving grace I find for me when kids need something to write about. The other thing is, every time I start a unit, I start, the first thing we do is brainstorm, create a brainstorming sheet of topics to write about. The topic bingo card is from the intermediate, uh, <coughs> I do have it here, is <coughs> from this book, Marvelous Mini Lessons for Teaching Intermediate Writing. And it's, all of those are sentence stems for narrative writing. So they, they can be topics for writing. The other, uh, the topic brainstorm sheet is from this one, nonfiction K to three, and that's for uh, writing an informational report. What are some things you're interested in re doing some research and learning about? So maybe hurricanes, maybe St. Patrick's Day, uh, maybe Lego. So the, the kids have these in their writing folders or in their topic pockets all the time so that there's always a reference point. There's always something available for them to, to choose a, a topic. The third thing I'll share, and this is my first day of school writing exercise for almost every grade, is the love it or loathe it chart. Think of two or three things you absolutely love and two or three things you cannot stand. Um, we even can teach a new vocabulary word here. It could be food, it could be a place, it could be something to do. My only rule is I'll allow them to put a person's name on the love it chart, and, but not on the loathe it chart. Now, I'm all for making teaching lives as simple as possible. And I would far rather sit in the staff room and have an extra cup of coffee in the morning than sit, stand in line at the photocopier to make something like this. So what we do is we simply, I just grabbed a piece of paper out of my recycling bin, grab a piece of paper, fold it in half, and you have the world's easiest graphic organizer. Two column notes on this side. And if you're teaching K1, I always, I, I know many of you heard, have heard me say this. I always say there's K1 and there's grade two to eternity because once they're reading and writing independently, the strategies are very similar whether they're seven or 17, but K1 is a world of its own. So even K1 can draw two picture, pictures of two things or people or you love foods. And on this side, draw a picture of two things, maybe two foods or things you don't like to do. And now we have a little repertoire of things that we might write about or draw or elaborate on. So when I've done the, the love it or loathe it chart, we spend a lot of time talking about it. Several years ago, I made a New Year's resolution. And you know, of course, when I say New Year's, I mean September. Uh, a New Year's resolution that I would not assign anything to my students without modeling it first. So I show them what my love it or loathe it chart looks like. And I talk through the things so that by the time they're ready to give it a try on their own, they've had a little chance to percolate and, and um, generate some ideas. When we're done, we stop and talk. I think we abandon talk too early. In K-1, I never have the kids write anything without talking to a partner or 
telling me what they're going to write about. And I find my struggling writers need to talk. They need to articulate before they, they can write. And um, I think all of us need to talk. Take a minute, talk to a partner and share the ideas off your chart. Maybe your partner has an idea that you would like to add as well. So we'll do that and then I'll say, okay, you know, good writing is about, the best writing comes from things that really matter to you. Things you love or things you hate, you know, shrimp. I can take it or leave it. Meh. You know, if somebody gives it to me at a dinner party, I'll eat it, but I won't likely order it in a restaurant. Now, who wants to read that? But soft ice cream, oh my goodness, you know, the BC fairies all have soft ice cream machines in the in the cafeterias. So it doesn't matter what time of day I'm on the ferry, 7 a.m., I made a make a beeline right for that soft ice cream machine. And you get a little cup and you fill it yourself, it's self-serve, but I have mastered how to put about this much ice cream on top of this little cup. Now, look at there are three details right there. And I haven't even started Regina people on the Milky Way, the best ice cream store in the world on Victoria Avenue in Regina. And they have a, a different soft flavor every day. When it's orange, I feel like I've died and gone to heaven. So I tell the kids, look at how I just made five finger facts. I made I just told you five details about my topic because right. That's what writing is about. Topics and details. The six trait framework uses the term ideas, but I think details is a little more concrete, you know, and elaboration is adding details to details and facts are details that are information, not part of storytelling. So then I'll have the kids pick one of your topics. See if you can think of five finger facts about that topic, five details and tell a partner. So now they, they are able to generate and articulate before we expect them to write it down. So there are three things we can do to mitigate problems with kids choosing their own topic. The big ideas bag and anchor chart, uh, the love it or loathe it chart, or just graphic organizers that might go with a particular unit or uh, theme or uh, genre that we're studying. So that is a big thing for um, uh, for building independence. The other thing too, I want to train my kids to be able to talk to each other about their writing. And this is what we do in author's chair. We tell somebody reads a piece of writing and we tell them what we love about it. And we ask them questions. I wish you told me about how long your dog was lost before you found it. I wish you would tell me um, how big you, the turtle was. I wish you so wishes are like questions, but what a compliment to a writer to say we are so interested in your piece of writing that we want to know we would like to know more. So wishes are compliments. It's often a, the author's chair and the peer conference is often a time to model the language. Wow, that ending is just like the bow on a present just wraps the piece up neatly. So we can give kids language to talk to each other about their writing when we're doing stars and wishes all together. So those are those are some of the reasons why I think a writing workshop approach is really so incredibly powerful for kids, uh, for kids and for teachers as well. Now, what's the te if the kids are so independent, what's the teacher doing <laughs> like any teacher? has a pair of shoes, wears a pair of shoes like that at school, but is nothing to do but sit, sit back and, and text her friends. I'm afraid not. <laughs> the great thing is we, if we don't have to be policing behaviors, if the kids are independent, we can do what we were trained to do. We can do the things that actually make our kids smarter. And that's explicit teaching and conferring with individuals and small groups. Which brings me to the, the teaching piece, the teaching of, of the writing workshop. The teaching piece is maximum 15 minutes. And that's only if the kids are, you know, if we're doing something interactive, like a shared writing, or if they're practicing something, mostly our, our lessons are short and they focus on strategies. I shudder to think of how many years I use teaching time to do th say things like write a poem about spring or 
uh, you know, write uh, a biography of your favorite relative. Those are assigning, not teaching. How do I know? A, what did our my kids learn from doing that? B, how do I know if they've learned anything? So now the research tells us focus on a strategy, on something a writer does. Start a piece of writing, open a piece with a question. And with a wraparound to the beginning, use vivid verbs. Um, organize a piece of opinion writing with the most, you know, the the um, most powerful argument first. So we focus on strategies. We teach one point per lesson, and of course, we always think of the gradual release of responsibility. And that's something I've done with these two books that I hadn't previously. I make sure that every lesson has an I do, a we do, and a you do. You know, I got to confess, as a teacher, probably that we do part is the part that I haven't always done very well. In fact, the current research is saying that if anything, and the, uh, the gradual release, you know, has been around David Pearson and Margaret Gallagher, 1986. You know, it's older than many of you are. And, and yet... I think we haven't always paid close enough attention, you know, the, uh, the I'll do a wonderful lesson and I'll say now, children, go forth and write. And then I get that, you know, look of confusion or the blank stare because I leaped from modeling and demonstration to independent application without giving them a chance to try it out in a safe and supported setting. And current research on the gradual release is saying the we do piece is more important than we ever knew. So every lesson in my book now, my books now look a little bit like this. Start with the one um, learning goal. I'm going to show, I'm going to either write and do some modeling myself or if possible, use a piece of professional writing, a book, or use a piece of student writing. Then we're going to try that strategy out together either as a shared writing where the kids collaborate to, on the text and I do the writing, or an interactive writing where they take turns writing, or even collaborative writing where they write with a partner. And then I always expect them to be accountable for what they've learned. And I think that's really important. Today in writing workshop, you should. Um, here's what I want you to do. So let's say I'm teaching uh, contractions, by the way, by the way, there's decades of research that says grammar instruction separate from writing has at best no impact on improving writing. In fact, in fact, there's some studies that have shown classes that had grammar instruction in out of context, the kids actually declined in their writing. So teach, why not teach contractions as part of writing workshop? I'll tell them what a contraction is. We call them shortcut words. I'll show them some examples in writing. And then maybe I'll give them a, some words on strips of paper and, a, and scissors and have them actually cut up, cannot, take out the letters that, that are replaced and put in an apostrophe, actually manipulate. And then I'll say today in writing workshop, I would like you to use two shortcut words in your writing. Guess what, guys? You can even highlight them. Take a highlighter and highlight your shortcut words. Of course, what's more thrilling than that for grade two? But my ulterior motive is I don't have to drag home 24 writing folders and dig through their writing to see if they know what a, a contraction is. I can just do my quick little butterfly conference where I buzz or my, uh, uh, sorry, honeybee conference where I buzz around and alight at each student's desk and take a quick look at what they've highlighted and do my ass assessment on the spot to see if who's getting it or he, whether we need to do some more work on it. So let me share a couple of my uh, favorite mini lessons, one for uh, early primary and one for uh, upper grades, and uh, just show you how this might transpire. I have to mention bubblegum or book writing. Book writing is, of course, conventional spelling. Bubblegum writing, it, I tell the kids, pretend the word is a piece of bubble gum in your mouth and stretch it out with one hand. With the other hand, write a letter for every sound that you hear. That's the goal of invented spelling. 
stretching it out and hearing all the sounds. Now, I always tell the kids, if you know the word in book writing, write it in book writing. If you don't know it in book writing, write it in bubblegum writing. And so I'll show them and I'll think aloud as I do some modeling. I went camping in the, you know, went, went camping. And I'll, I'll model my think aloud and I'll say, you know, a word like I. I is the first word I teach in kindergarten, by the way. I teach it the first day of kindergarten. Um, the, one of my kids said to me one time, ever since I learned that word the, I see it in everything I read. So those are the words, you know, when they know the word in book writing, then I get them to take out their little whiteboards, and, which in my case are plastic plates from Dollarama. Um, and I'll have them, I'll say, everybody write school. And so they spell school however they want. And we show each other that bubblegum writing doesn't always look the same for everybody, whereas book writing looks the same for everybody. The is T-H-E. Doesn't matter who writes it or who reads it. But sometimes bubblegum writing, in fact, sometimes only the writer can read it. So we do some guided practice so that I can say today in writing workshop, I want you to think about bubblegum or book writing. Um, now I'm trying to wean these kids of having to do any kind of scribble writing to actually use letters. So you can see that lesson is five minutes. We practice some bubblegum writing on our whiteboards and then they go off. And today in writing workshop, I'm going to be looking for, if you know the word in book writing, write in book writing. If not, write it in bubblegum writing. I do want to share um, <clears throat> this study because it's a new study and it's Canadian. University of Ottawa, Jean Ouellette and Monique Senecal did this re research. And I, we've known for 40 years that when kids are encouraged to spell inventively, they become better spellers. But this study found that when kids are encouraged to spell inventively, they become better readers as well. And down the road, influence subsequent reading and conventional spelling. So I think I'm just doing cartwheels over finding this research because I, I'm, you know, I think it's so very important. Well, that would be a typical 10 minute mini lesson, guided practice. Now you're off on your own. And then when they're writing, I can be circulating around and, and taking a look at, at what they're working on or pull small groups. Here's a, le a lesson for a little bit older kids. <laughs> We've been told the golden rule of writing is don't tell, show. So what I, this lesson is I want to teach kids the difference between showing details and telling details. Now, whenever I can use a literature link, I sure will do that. Look, use uh, professional writers writing to show them an example. Then we're going to practice it together. And then today in writing workshop, I want you to find a telling detail in your writing and see if you can either add a showing detail or replace it with a showing detail. Here's an example. This is from a book. I'll show you the book called The Dirty Cowboy. And it is such a fun book. And I meant to check and see. I'm sure you can find it online. Maybe Storytime Online might have somebody reading it if you don't have it in your own lap. Uh, library. And you can see it's really not a picture book for the very young. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to read the first couple of pages. And this is I combined the first two or three pages. But to show you an example, we we look for ways that the author, Amy Timberlake, has used showing details. At the end of two fence lines and right at the rock called the Prey and Iguana lived a cowboy in a tin roof shack. Now, one morning and no one knows for sure what drives a man to it this cowboy decided to clean himself up regular bathers would have said the signs had been plenty clear the cowboy's hair housed 32 fleas and a small gray spider on three recent occasions he discovered a tumbleweed in his chaps a flurry of flies flocked round his body buzzing so persistently that he experienced a distinct loss of hearing in his left ear and the cowboy's stench stuck to passers-by like mud splashed up from a wagon wheel but whatever his reason on that fateful day, the cowboy picked a doodle bug out of his right eyebrow and said, this old boy needs a bath. Now, we talk about what do we know about the cowboy? He's dirty. He's filthy. Can you find the word dirty anywhere in that? 
No. So what has Amy Timberlake done to show us he's dirty so she doesn't have to tell us? So then we take a look. I'll put this slide back up in just a minute. Then we take a look at all of the ways that she showed us. The cowboy's hair housed 32 fleas. He discovered a tumbleweed in his chaps. A flurry of flies flocked around his body. So we look for examples. The book, again, if you're interested, The Dirty Cowboy, uh, written by Amy Timberlake and illustrated by Adam Rex. It's, it's quite hilarious. The cowboy's naked for most of the book because he has to walk a full day down to the river to uh, take his bath. Um, but the illustrator, Adam Rex, has strategically placed the illustrations so that to keep the book G-rated. And it's full of wonderful literary language and, and lots of fun to revisit. I always say if we use a literature link, we should never read the book the first time as a writer. I always read the book the first time as a reader, and then we come back and revisit it for elements of the writer's craft. So once my students have, once we've looked at Amy Timberlake's examples, here are a whole bunch of telling statements. What we're going to do is maybe pick one all together, do what I call the five finger planner, trace your hand on a piece of paper again, the recycling bin, which is right beside me here, and write the telling statement on the palm, and one sh make up a showing detail for each finger that goes with that telling statement. We might do it as a class. I think the house was haunted. What do you? Uh, what would be a showing detail? Um, strange noises emanated from the upstairs rooms. A thunderstorm crashed and rattled the windows. Now, you'll notice, and for those of you teaching upper grades, take a look at these telling details. What do you notice about the verb in every one? Is, are, was. Telling details tend to have the verb to be is our was, were, and be being. Showing details use rich verbs. And we know that effective writing is full of rich verbs. So that's another piece that I teach the kids is that we go back and say, wow, the cowboy's hair housed 32 fleas. A flurry of flies flocked right it. His stench stuck to passersby. So why not teach a little grammar in this as well and say, let's use as we're practicing together with a partner or all together, as we're practicing showing details, let's make sure we include some vivid verbs in them as well. And then, of course, today in writing workshop, I want you to uh, make sure to use, as I said, go back into a, a piece of writing and find um, find a place where you've used a telling detail and see if you can replace it or enhance it. Push in, which is what I tell the kids I call uh, inserting details. You can push in another detail to show us as well as tell us. So there, there's an example. I probably would have to do that lesson over two days. That probably day one, we would look at, um, just look at the text and Amy Timberlake's examples. And day two, we'd go back and practice it together before I expected them to do this on their own. But what I find is the kids have a much better capacity to use these strategies when they've had a chance to practice them. Goes without saying, that's the gradual release. The other thing we teachers are doing um, is conferring with individuals and small groups. I mentioned uh, the walkabout with little kids. I call it the bumblebee or honeybee conference where I just buzz around and, and check on, make sure everybody's got, is getting started and, and has something to work on. The tag isn't a revision conference. That is, uh, that we do only on, I only do it on pieces they're going to publish because I find my students write too much for me to do a tag on everything. But it's my my favorite part of the of my the writing workshop is my favorite part of the day and the tag conference is my favorite part of the writing workshop because it's a chance for me to provide just in time teaching targeted right to that student's piece of writing and then of course before we publish we go back in and polish it to publish fix up the spelling and conventions um you know Mem Fox has called conventions the good manners of writing. And I think that uh, it's what we do as 
the courtesy to our reader. If no one else is going to read it, doesn't matter how we spell the words as long as we can read it. But as soon as we're going to give it to someone else, I think we owe it to them to use um, conventional spelling and conventional capitals and punctuation to make it easier for them to read. Well, just the last thing I'll talk about today, because the, I hope that I hope the time has gone as quickly for you as it has for me. Um, the TAG conference, TAG stands for tell something you like, ask questions, give advice. And we always focus on what the writing says, not capitals and periods and punctuation. It's brief. I only have about three minutes to spend with each student, so I have to plan ahead. So what I do is I have the students, it, when they've chosen a piece of to publish, and we're talking grade three to eternity here, or grade two to eternity, put it in my tag conference basket. I take a look at the writing and plan what I'm going to say. I just cannot give meaningful feedback on the spot, especially with my older kids who are, you know, writing more detailed pieces. So I'm going to fo focus on the writing, not the writer. And I'm going to take about two minutes to just show you an example. This is a piece of grade four writing from Regina long ago, The Black Widow. I'm going to tell you about The Black Widow. First, I'm going to tell you about where it lives. It lives in certain places in North America and Australia. That is where The Black Widow lives. Now I'm going to tell you about what it looks like, or another word for it is description. It is black except for these three red dots on its belly. It is really big and has long legs. That is all I can really tell you about what a Black Widow does. Finally, the interesting fact, the Black Widow is poisonous to people. The false Black Widow is harmless, though. Did you know that the female is bigger than the male? Did you also know that the female bites? If you didn't, well, you do now. That is the end of my interesting facts and my report on the Black Widow. I hope you liked it. This is a lesson uh, right out of the intermediate uh, book on uh, the, in the nonfiction lessons. So what do I say? First, I've got to find something to tell her that she's done well, and I will say, she has stuck to her topic nobly. She has really a lot of facts and they're all about the Black Widow. So I love that. And I'm, I would say to her, you know what else I really like? I like the paragraph where you talk about the interesting facts, because we've talked about the fact that the best writing has surprising details that the reader is not going to expect to see. And it's full of surprising details. Plus, you know what I love is that you put questions in. Anytime you ask a question, you're drawing the reader into the writing. So here I've told her a few things I love about the piece of writing. Now, I'm going to ask a question either about clarity of content or decisions she's made as a writer. So I could, there are a few. For starters, what is a black widow? Oh, and you say it is really big. Now, that is what I call a fuzzy fact. You better tell me how big is it and how many legs does it have? So there are some questions that she can look at to improve clarity because often kids don't realize what's going to be confusing to a reader. Then uh, I'm just wondering why you did a topic sentence at the beginning of each paragraph and at the end. Well, she's going to say, because that's that's how I was. That's how Lester's teacher taught me to do. And the and I know that that. It, we're often taught, you know, topic sentence, three details, topic sentence. Nowhere in published writing will you ever find a paragraph with a topic sentence, three details, and a uh, wrap-up sentence. Not every paragraph even has a topic sentence, but I assure you it's never repeated in the beginning and the end. So I, why did you, you know, why did you decide to, to say, why did you just say, now I'm going to tell you, now I'm going to tell you? Well. You wanted, she might say, I wanted to, you know, and you said I should do a topic sentence. So what my piece of advice for her was, first thing I'm going to suggest, so let's try and prune out the last pair, the last sentence of every paragraph. Already, it's a better piece of writing. And then I might say, you know, I asked you two things. What is a black widow and how big is it? So would you pick one of those details to make that, that add some elaboration instead of that fuzzy fact? Or if I've taught them 
different ways to do a topic sentence. One of my lessons in my in the intermediate book is gems that make writing sparkle, like ask a question, give a, a quote from an expert, um, give an exclamation. So there are different ways that we can make this writing more, make our topic sentences more interesting. Can you fix two of your topic sentences? Can you change them? Take a look at our anchor chart and see some different ways that you can add some, um, some bling to this piece of writing. So that's what my conference would look like. Takes, you know, three or four minutes. That's all I have. But it is that time for the writer and me to work together to not just improve that piece of writing, but hopefully give her some strategies to use down the road. <clears throat> well, just to wrap up, and I don't know if um, I, I think um, Lionel is monitoring questions. So just to wrap up what I, um, uh, there's a, a piece of information from Tony Wagner. He's identified seven essential skills for success. But what I think is really interesting about what he's saying is whenever kids come out of school into the real world and there are concerns about their writing, it's never about the grammar. It's never about spelling. It's about fuzzy thinking and lack of voice. So I think, you know, I work a lot with the six traits framework, and I know that a lot, a lot of you do too. And I think it's really, you know, when we, I've often said, well, the six traits, ideas, organization, voice, sentence, fluency, word choice, and conventions are equal slices of the pie. But you know, I think voice is the most important. If a piece of writing speaks to you, then you can forgive almost anything else. Voice is the connection with the audience. It is, um, it, it is how you want the audience to react. Do you want the audience to laugh? Do you want the audience? What about, take a look at this uh, here, little piece of writing. Dear Mrs. Clark, I heard you did not feel good. Well, when that happens, here's a trick to learn. Just go poop. I'm not kidding. It works with me every morning. I feel bad. So just remember when you feel bad, the first thing you do is poop. And just in case you didn't get it, there's even an illustration. So he is trying to, to teach, to try to give a piece of advice, and he is just so sincere with that information. Voice is really about the topic, the reader, and what, how we want the reader to respond. Are we telling a story? Are we making people laugh? Are we trying to make people angry or agree with us? And just very br briefly, one of the things I do when I'm one of the lessons, and this is a lesson right out of the book, is I'll we'll take the same topic, but we'll describe it, write it in different ways for different audiences and different purposes. Well, our time is, is just about up, so I will remind you. I think we might have five minutes for questions, if there are any. Um, I will remind you that uh, Pembroke Publishers has my book. My name, uh, my email is there still. I have a Vancouver home address, a Toronto phone number, and a Saskatel email. But uh, I will leave that with you. Just one more thing I will invite you to take a look at is hip hyphenbooks.com and if you go to the home page you'll see a little box that says hip tips i send out a free teaching tip to your inbox every week you don't have to buy anything it's just right there uh, if you're interested in taking a look and signing up for my hip tips and with that i hope that you picked up a few things along the way i say thank you to lionel for keeping us on track here and i if there are any questions i would be happy to, to discuss them well, I think you deserve the credit for keeping us on track, Lori, because uh, that that was great. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's funny as, as I was I was listening, and you know, in, in in the group that that's been with us over the last year, there's always sort of that connection back to this strange virtual world that we have right now. Um, I'm assuming everything you're talking about, you know, you can you can modify, and you've seen examples of say the writing workshop can be done virtually. Of course, it's better in class, but someone shouldn't say oh i can't do that now because of the way things are at is that a fair statement or would you look at that differently i think that right this lends itself perfectly to online teaching because when we have our whole, the whole class in front of us we can do the mini lesson then the kids can go off independently and do their writing and we can touch check in with them individually and, to, and have them share their writing um, either scan it or hold it up mm -hmm. or if they're word processing and uh, uh, 
we can we can meet them where they are and it's one i think writing is one of the few things that does lend itself really easily to or more easily than most i'll say than to yeah, online learning yeah. and and i mean it, it clearly came through your passion for the writing and it made me think that if i was in a school and i really liked what you were saying but maybe the school wasn't doing that is is this a school wide activity you know i don't mean that to be a leading question because i think the answer is yes but um you know, there's so many demands on a teacher these days that, you know, I could see how this could get lost. So if I was passionate about this and I was building off your energy, should I be looking at this first, kind of getting a handle on it myself? Or is this something to maybe, hey, I should take this back to the school and we do it as a school. Have you seen examples of that or? One of my colleagues used to describe the years that her own children had writing workshop as their trip to Paris because it was That's just great. this novelty and so exciting for them. Ideally, we're going, everything I've talked about, pretty much we can do from kindergartens right through high school. Yeah. Um, but we only can control our ourselves and yeah. what we're doing here. And so if, if you can put this together systemically with uh, your whole school so that you can build on the language that kids hear the same language every, every year, great. Um, not always possible, but start start with ourselves. Pick one thing that we're to do. I mean, we do have tons on our plate. And I think we need to always be asking ourselves the question, is what I'm doing, is everything I'm doing making my kids better readers, writers, and thinkers? Yeah. And dedicate our time. I get I rant frequently on the curriculums that curricula that have nine thousand learning objectives. When you know, so we're going like a, a kilometer wide and a centimeter thick instead of going in depth. And that's what writing workshop does takes us yeah. in depth. Yeah, with some really good instructional practice, just buried naturally things come out and you you identified those all the way through and I like how you use the research to connect that in there so I'll this, share this, one last if I can share one sure. last little piece of research and many of you have heard me say this before but I love a quote from Brian Camborn that says you've got to know how to read to learn about the world but you got to know how to write to change the world and I think all of you who are, are have joined us here tonight the work you do every day is setting up kids to change the world. It's thanks to you that everything else has been able to open up in our economies. Teachers are holding the fort and you are setting up kids to change the world, even in these times. I thank you for that. Thanks for being here. And uh, I think it's uh, it fair to say uh, on behalf of, uh, of the, the Pembroke Publishers, also thank you for everything you've done and uh they would also like for everyone that's attended if you would like a uh, five dollars off your next purchase of any one of Lori's books there is a, an offer that uh they've uh, they've put out there uh you just have to click on that particular um link and that'll take you to the site and I just realized I forgot to put the code in, in there for the $5 off. So in the email that comes out tomorrow with the recording, I will make sure that uh, all that information is there as well so that uh, you can utilize that offer if you like. But the link will take you to the site and you can get to Lori's books that way. So Lori, uh, I'll let you have the last word in a second here, but uh, the, the scrolling through the chat, there's a, a, a large number of thank yous and folks that enjoyed the, uh, the session today. So thank you very much for uh, taking this last hour and bringing your passion forward around writing and giving us practical uh, ideas, but also a nice flow to how you can take the, the writing workshop into, like you said, any grade at any point. So thank you very much for that. And I'll let you, I would say, uh, take us out tonight. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Sure. I, you know what, Lionel, I, I can put my email up again in case anybody has something they want to touch base with me. L. Jamison at sasktel.net. And uh, good luck, everyone, with uh, this crazy, crazy year. <laughs>